in our psalm that was read, I invite you to look at even closely, more closely, in this week ahead. Take it home, cut it out, put it on your fridge, because these are wonderful, powerful words. Words of which Martin Luther King Jr. held so dear himself. These are words of King David, where he said, I come to the end, I am still with you. This whole psalm points out the importance of being hemmed in. Of being hemmed in by God, like just surrounded with the presence of God in a way that gives one courage and strength and peace. The year is 1968. The place, Memphis, Tennessee, and Elvis Presley is living at Graceland with his wife Priscilla and his newborn daughter, Lisa Marie. And he is enjoying the Grammy that he has just won for his second gospel album, How Great Thou Art. In the minds of many, he is the king. Yet in March of that year, another king comes to town. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. travels to Memphis to lead a march in support of the city sanitation workers. These 1,300 workers, most of whom are black, have been treated, have, have been on strike for safer working conditions, higher wages, and equal treatment. Unfortunately, several militant groups turned the march very violent. And King announced over a bullhorn to the crowd, saying, I will never lead a violent march, so please call it off. He promised then to come back to Memphis in early April to lead a non-violent march, which he did. He returned April 3rd, 1968. Several death threats had been directed at King, and the tension is high, but he feels that it's important to press on and speak at this rally on behalf of those sanitation workers. In the course of his address, which turns out to be the last speech he will ever give, he tells the story of an earlier attempt on his life years before, one that brought him perilously close to death. According to Ralph Abernathy, his friend and successor, Martin Luther King Jr. stood up that night and just preached out his fear. I want to read for you some of his powerful speech. He says, You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. And while sitting there autographing books, a demented black woman came to me. The only question I heard from her was, Are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down and writing, and I said, Yes. And the next minute, I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented woman. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon, and that blade had gone through. And the x-ray revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, that main artery in your heart. And once that's punctured, you drown in your own blood, and that is the end of you. He goes on to say, it came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had sneezed, I would have died. Sometime after the operation, after my chest had been opened, the blade taken out, they allowed me to move around and to read the mail that had come in from all over the states and the world. Kind letters had come in. I read a few, but one I will never forget. I'd received telegrams from the president and vice president, but I have forgotten what those messages said. 
I received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York. But I forgot what was said. But there was another letter that came from a young girl at the White Plains High School. And I looked at that letter, and I will never forget it. It said simply, Dear Dr. King, I'm a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. She said, while it should not matter, I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering. And I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. And I'm simply writing to you to say that I am so happy that you did not sneeze. And Martin Luther goes on to say, I want to say tonight, I want to say that I too am happy that I did not sneeze. Because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters. And I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best of the American dream. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1962 when the Negroes in Albany, Georgia decided to straighten their backs up. And whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they're going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it's bent. If I had sneezed, he goes on to say, I wouldn't have been here in 1963 when the black people of Birmingham, Alabama aroused the conscience of this nation and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later that same year to tell America about a dream I had. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis tonight to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I am so happy that I did not sneeze, proclaimed Martin Luther King. Look at all that he wouldn't have participated in. If he had not remained very still, very calm, and very peaceful during that attempt on his life, he would not have been part of one of the greatest movements for justice and equality that our nation has ever known. Not that King took personal credit for his survival. He did not. He gave all the glory to God. And in his autobiography, he wrote, If I demonstrated unusual calm during that attempt on my life, it was certainly not due to any extraordinary powers that I possess. Rather, it was due to the power of God working through me. Throughout the struggle... For racial, racial justice, he says, I have constantly asked God to remove all bitterness from my heart and to give me the strength and the courage to face any and every disaster that came my way. This constant prayer life and feeling of dependence on God have given me the feeling that I have divine companionship in the struggle. I know no other way to explain it, he says. It is the fact that in the midst of the external tension, God can give an inner peace. Do you hear the perseverance? Do you hear all of the reasons that he could have gone the other way? Life was hard. He did not live every day in the face of agreement of his fellow man. In the course of his life, Martin Luther King Jr. walked through many dangers, toils, and snares. But through it all, he knew that God was with him, had him hemmed in, had everything given to him that he needed to succeed. The Lord was his divine companion in the civil rights struggle, giving him strength and courage to face every disaster that came his way. He had the very same faith that King David, the writer of Psalm 139, who said to the Lord, you hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. 
We know life is fragile. Life is hard. It is full of danger. And yet we can draw comfort from the knowledge that God is with us in all that we do. In the midst of external tension, God can give us an inner peace. This peace gives us courage, confidence, inspiration, strength. But most of all, it frees us to do God's will. You can hear that in Martin Luther King's speech. This is important. Because when we think of that word peace, it doesn't necessarily protect us from pain and suffering. It doesn't shield us from the hardship that comes from taking bold stands for the Lord in a world that so often resists the Lord's reign. In fact, in the very short life of Martin Luther King, death by an assassin's bullet came just one day after this speech. In that rally at Memphis, Tennessee, God's peace didn't give King a long life, but it did give him life long. It never failed him. This peace enabled him to say to the Lord, along with David in Psalm 139, I come to the end and I still am with you. And it made all the difference in the world. In his work for justice, if King had not felt inner peace, he wouldn't have been able to organize that Montgomery bus boycott. If he had not felt God's inspiration and insight, He wouldn't have been able to give his I have a dream speech. If he had not felt God's courage and confidence, he would not have been able to launch launch a major voter registration drive called Crusade for Citizenship. If he had not felt God's courage and confidence, he would not have been able to defy death threats and stand with those city sanitation workers in Memphis. The Lord's peace does free us. It tells us we have everything that we need and that God is surrounding us, hemming us in. I want you to take a look at your bulletin because in the back there's a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's the end of this speech that I was reading to you. I'm going to read it for you. But just imagine these, his last words to us in public. He says, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I am not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go to the mountain. And I've looked over and I have seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Do you hear the power in those words? The courage, the perseverance, and to know the next day he was killed for these very words. God does not free us from all troubles, from our struggles, our stumbles, or our sneezes. He knows that we're going to hit bumps and potholes along the road, along the road to the promised land, and that we will need his presence and his power to stay on the right path. Like Martin Luther King, we're never going to be free from adversity, but we are always free to serve God in every time, and place, and situation. May our freedom 
be used to do the will of the one who is our king, our heavenly king. Amen.